Welcome to Python Programming. My name is Richard Kirshner with the Simply Learn team. That's www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. If you have any questions on the video or have other additional questions to uh, what's covered in here, feel free to visit us at www.simplylearn.com or you can even post a note down below the YouTube because we do monitor those comments. In this video, we're going to cover the installation of Python and PyCharm. And we'll go over variables, we'll cover numbers, strings, and then the input method. And we'll follow that up with lists, if else, and for loop. Once we've covered those basics, we'll get into the wild loop, nested loops, functions, dictionary, arrays, and we'll even set up a simple hangman game. Now, before we dive into writing script and actually typing in some code, we need a package to type that in, an IDE, a user interface. So we're going to use PyCharm. You can see here, welcome to PyCharm is the window that opens up for me. And the reason we use PyCharm, and there's a few others out there, PyCharm and Jupyter Notes are probably the most common ones. PyCharm creates virtual environments. That means whatever I'm doing in PyCharm is separate from the rest of my computer and its processes as it's going on. That way I'm not worried about corrupting things or messing something up. It's its own little world. So whatever I'm doing is in that world, which makes it a really powerful tool. So you can install Python on your computer direct, or you can install it in a protected box like PyCharm creates in the virtual environment. And usually, I always bring up the search engine. I just do download Python. You don't know how many searches I do for these things because I never remember what they're... Uh, where they're at and you can go to the Python original site. Now this will install it on the computer so that any program can access it when you do it this way. And this is where Python comes from. Welcome to python.org. You can go up here and there's all kinds of documentations, downloads. If you go to downloads, I always suggest going to the full list of downloads and going back one version. And the reason is, is whatever you're working on, if you're working with data science, which Python is well known for, and that's probably the biggest growing field right now is uh, in the data science industry. You really want to be careful because there's a lot of packages that won't run on Python 3.7, which just came out in this case. Maybe it's 3.8 by the time you watch this. So I always go back and view the full list of downloads, and then you go back by one and you look for uh, 3.6. And so I'm running everything in 3.6 on this demo, just for that reason, because that's what I have installed. And I'll probably eventually upgrade all my modules into Python 3.7 once I know that they're solid. Now, you don't need to install Python directly on your machine. This is if you're going to run your code on your computer and do something else with it later on. So save this. If you're just getting started in Python, don't worry about this part. Uh, this is for later on, but you need to know that Python is its own code and script. So I do the same thing. I go download PyCharm. Again, I like my search engines because I never remember what I put where. This will open up your features PyCharm site. And once you're under here, you can go up to the download page. And this will open up your downloads, and you have download PyCharm. You have the professional version. If you want to pay money, this actually, in the long run, if you're running a business or corporation, allows you to integrate your different programmers together. So it's a really powerful tool as a company. But as an individual, the community version, the lightweight IDE, is perfect. One, it's open source, so it's free, which is really nice. This is how uh, uh, JetBrains makes their money off of the PyCharm. They make it by selling a um, commercial version, a professional version. But the community version works just fine. And then once you've run the install, you'll see here where you have this icon with the PC with the green and yellow background, PyCharm uh, setup. And then we open it. That's where we started off at. And we'll go ahead and just create a new project. We'll call it uh, PyCharm Python Basics. That's what we're covering today. And I've already set PyCharm. I've already set my default path to where I put my different programming stuff in. And since this is for Simply Learn, that's my path I put in there. Default creates a PyCharm folder, and you can change this path to wherever you want it and whatever you're working on. Go ahead and create this project here. And this is setting up literally a virtual environment. Again, it's a box that separates it from the rest of my computer, so I don't have to worry. Whatever I do in here, if I am working in Python 3.6, I can create another box that has Python 3.7, I can then take that code, open it up, and see if it runs in 3.7. See if there's a problem with the modules and the version numbers. So very important thing to know. We don't need to worry about that with this because uh, this is already set to 3.6. And everything we're doing in here is basic Python, so it'll work in any of the Python versions you download. 
And then once we're in here, we're going to create a new scratch file. And you can just go straight to new scratch file or you can click on new and you'll see you have some different setups depending on what's going on. This one, I don't have anything special set up on it, so it only allows me to add a scratch file to the project. And then you have all your choices of what kind of scratch files. You can do a lot of different stuff in PyCharm. It's not limited to just Python, even though that's what it's made for. But Python can be used as a backend for your server setup. So you can actually do a call a Python file on the server, just like you can call a number of other files, and no one ever sees it. And then it comes back as an HTML code. And there's all kinds of cool things you can do. It's a full programming language. That's why there's such a shift to Python with the data science. It used to be primarily in R. And once you've set it up here, you'll see, um, and I actually have a bunch of different scratches that have gone on over, over time, where it's just scratch one, two, three. You can always rename these. If you right-click on it, you'll see refactor, rename. So let's say I don't want to call it scratch three. We want to actually call it PyCharm. Oh, this is called Python Basic. Python, let's do Python, PyCharm Basics, and then refactor. Uh, and refactor means it's going through, and if you have a number of files that are referencing this one, it will refactor all of them so they point in the right direction. That's one of the nice things about using these IDEs. They do a lot of the work for you. And then we have our code. We can just start typing our code in here on the right. And we always start, this is like the number one programmer's code, hello world. So we'll just type in print hello world. You'll see that hello world is in brackets. And then if we go under run, you can run it this way. You can also do alt shift F10. That's the same thing as running. And this is going to run this code. And it's going to ask you which code are you going to run. You can edit configuration, but it'll automatically default to what you're working on. And it runs this code, and then you see a box appear down below. And what we have down below is a console setup. And so it's run the program. Here's our hello world. It printed it out. And you can see I've got the font sized up a little bit, so hopefully you can see it well. And then process, finish, it, and exit code. And if you've gotten this far, congratulations. You just ran your first code, your first code in PyCharm print hello world. Let's go ahead and show you something down here. So you can see the window opened up down on the bottom and there's tabs on the very bottom. You'll see Python console, terminal, run, and to do. And so this is a run window. The terminal window literally opens a terminal environment where I can type in whatever I want on here. This is for doing installing and things like that. We're not going to cover that today, but I do want to cover Python console. And uh, oops, I got a little pop-up because my Windows firewall, so we'll just allow access to it. The console, basically you can run straight off a console. So I can print hello world. And if I go to the end of my console, I hit enter, you'll see it does the same thing. It prints hello world. And so I could run it line by line down here, or I can type in all my code and run all the lines at once. That's what the difference is between doing it as a, and they call it a scratch, but doing it as a Python file versus doing it in the console. Now, I'll do some stuff in the console if I forget what my code is and what I'm doing. So I might forget, oh, how the heck do I do print? Was it print brackets, hello world? And you'll see that I left out the quotation marks, and it comes up and says, oh, syntax error. And I go, oh, that wasn't right. So we definitely have a little options here, some few options just to check out your code as you're going. And you can see you can quickly um, make sure it's doing what you want to do in the console. Some people do like all their coding in the console and it amazes me. I can't do that. I have to see my code as it's going up here and rerun it over and over again. And it brings us back to our run code down below. In PyCharm, there are a lot of different settings and things you can do in here. Real quick, let's go under File and under Settings. And this has your appearance, your menus, your system settings. You can go down here, your editor, project, version. Version control is very important because I can come down here and see what's in the background and what's going on. It has all kinds of interfaces. But even more important for the most basic setup is you want to look at the project folder. You'll see Project PyCharm Python Basics. I remember I was talking about version 3.7 versus 3.6. When you click on the pull-down arrow, you'll see the project version here. And you can see up here, I'm in Python 3.6. And let's say I wanted to test my code in something else. I only have 3.6 installed on this particular PyCharm version. But I can add other different Python versions in here. So I can do a plus on here and just add in another setup. I can add in different tools and setups underneath here also for this project. And only this project will use it. So if I'm using Python 3.7, in my main environment running stuff, I can now have a box and I can test it on 3.6 or 3.8 when it comes out. That way I'm always up on the different Python versions and I can always double check my code and make sure it's going to work in them. And we're going to do a quick change in the appearance. I have it as font size 12. Let's, you can go in here and change all kinds of stuff on here. 
I'm just going to bump this way up, apply that, okay, just so you can see what's going on better. There we go. Nice big bold font. I should have done that at the very beginning. So we have our print hello. Let's start diving into the code. This is um, exciting. I don't know about you, but I love to code and I love to try to figure these things out and how they fit together. Well, we did our first program. We did print hello world. But now we want to do a little bit more and we want to go ahead and print but we want it to actually do something, not just display it. So we're going to go ahead and put the sum is, and you'll see here we have, it's going to print just like we did print hello world. We're going to add a comma in so I can print different objects and separate them with a comma. And I can actually do the code right in here. And this is part of the Python way, is you do the code wherever you can. They call it the Python way because it looks very simple. And we'll show you some other variations of this in just a minute. But we can do the sum is, and we have 5 plus 10. And if you remember, we can go under run, and that's also alt shift F10. I'm going to do that one. Alt shift F10, and then just hit enter because it's already on the Python PyCharm basics. And you can see here we have our original one that says hello world, and then it says the sum is and this is nice because it already did the calculation for us. It did 5 plus 10. Now, if we wanted to print 5 plus 10, we would do 5, comma, plus, in brackets, 10. And so if I run this one, you will see that this prints very differently. This one comes in and says the sum is 5 plus 10 doesn't give me the answer. Or if we go back, you can just do a control Z, you'll get five plus 10 and we get our answer on there. And there's our alt shift F10 and run the basics. And the sum is 15. And then we'll go ahead and just copy this line and we'll put it down here. We can do the same thing, but instead of plus, we'll do minus. My insert must be on. And we'll set this to five minus 10. And if we run that, let's switch it around. I like to stay positive. This will create a negative number. 10 minus five, it doesn't matter really which direction you go in. And if we uh, do the run, you'll see that I go back and forth how I run it. We get 5, 10 minus 5. And you could just as easily change this at 2. Let's do 5 times 10. And then we'll also do 10 divided by 5. And this is not the sum, but the difference. And this is the product. And instead of the sum, we'll have the quotient. And so if I run these, and by the way, there's like so many different ways to run this. Um, I've been doing Control Shift Alt F10. I've gone to the top. It also has the bar up here. You can turn off the toolbar, and you can run the runoff of here, and it does the same thing. And you can see here we have the sum is 15, the difference is 5, 10 minus 5, the product is 50, and the quotient is 2.0. So it's actually converted this to float value or decimal value, a number for us. Now, this is great if all you wanted to know was the sum of 5 and 10 and the difference of 10 and 5 and 5 and 10 and 10 and 5. We'll just go ahead and remove all this stuff. Take that all out. Delete. There we go. Before I do this, let me just introduce the pound or hashtag. If you see that in Python, that means this is a comment. Ignore this line. So if I want to put notes in here, like what if we wanted to change 5 and 10 to 10 and 15, what if it happens if, we, if our code is coming in and we don't know what 5 and 10 or it's going to be 10 and 15 or we don't even know what it is we're going to be doing? I really don't want to have to retype that code all the time. And when you're programming, that should always be on your mind. If you're doing a lot of, like you saw how I did that copy and paste, remember I was pasting it in and then changing it? If you're doing a lot of that, chances are you need to fix your code a little bit. When you first start though, that's okay. And certainly while you're writing your code, you're gonna be doing that a lot and then you simplify it down. We're gonna create a variable and we'll call it A. In this case, I'm using capital A. You can use lowercase a. General terms, if I'm using a single letter for some things, I'll use it capitalized depending on what I'm doing on. Other things will be lowercase, like a lowercase, there we go. And ignore the pop-ups. That's different things that begin with a. That's part of PyCharm gives you a list of all kinds of things, code you can put in there. So, but we'll go capital A. And we're going to assign to a five. And so this is just like if you were taking your um, class in basic algebra where you have x equals 5y plus c, x, y, and c are variables. So a equals 5, and we'll enter on that. We'll do b equals 10, and then we can go ahead and do sum. Let's do capital S. We'll stick with the same setup on here. And you got to be a little careful with sum because there are certain modules that use that as a regular. We'll use sum. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and do lowercase because that is more standard to do sum, except that it will create an actual module. So we don't want to do that. We'll use capital S. There we go. That's why they did capital S. Sum equals A plus B. 
and then we'll do difference equals b minus a, and we'll do product equals a times b, and we'll do, we'll call it div instead of uh, quotient, we'll do div equals b over a. So the same thing we did before, but we're now assigning them to variables. So now we have all these variables. And uh, here's our print statement. The sum is, and instead of putting 5 and 10 here, we'll just put down sum. And uh, we had the other ones. We'll do this. Again, there's that copy and paste. So at some point, I'd probably want to ask, is there a way I can simplify that? But we'll do difference. So the difference is diff, and we'll do product. So there's our variable PROD for product, and the product is, and then finally our quotient, the quotient is. So when we look at this code here, we can see we have A equals 5, B equals 10, sum of A plus B, difference of B minus A, product of A times B, and div of B over A, and then we go ahead and display the uh, different mathematic answers there. And let's go ahead and run that. And I'll just click on the run button up here because I like that. It's actually quick and easy. We'll bring this up so you can see the bottom here. And sure enough, the sum is 15. The difference is 5. The product is 50. The quotient is 20. So we just ran a code that actually does some mathematics behind it, a very basic code. And you can see how as we continue to add our different tools in, we can manipulate numbers and do all kinds of fun things with our Python script. Now, these very basic math functions are so common that they're built into the basic Python setup. But there's more. So we're going to go ahead and explore numbers more. And you can see this is just a title. I've added the little hashtag at the beginning, so the code will be ignored. So it's just for a comment. And we'll go ahead and stick with our a, b. a equals uh, 5, b equals minus 10. I'm going to print. So in addition to before, we did all the plus, minus, times, divide. You can also do power. So if we wanted to do, say, a, key tilde thing, squared, the command for that is p-o-w, a, comma, 2. And this stands for power. So a to the second power. And you can do a cubed, a to the fourth power, and so on. And we'll go ahead and run this. And let's bring this back up so you can see what's going on underneath. And we get 5 squared is 25. And that's what we expect on there. That's pretty straightforward. At this point, we want to go ahead and import math. And math is a module outside of the basic Python, but it's included in all the Python installs. It's so commonly used. But you still have to import it for a lot of things. And one of those is doing the square root. If we want to print, and uh, let's give her a little print a title. We're doing square root, comma. First we mention the module we imported, and this is math, and then period and SQRT of A. And if we run this, you'll see down here that the square root is 2.236, and so on, so on. I'm not going to read the whole number. And you can, there's a lot of different commands in here. You can also print, let's do the absolute value. And I'll show you in just a second where to look this up. And there's our comma, because I'm two different. Uh, we have our string, absolute. And then we can do absolute value of B. Remember, B is minus 10. So when I run this, the absolute value should be 10. We can also do complex numbers. Let me show you that on here. Print. And always give it a nice label so we know what we're talking about. Complex number, comma, and they can do complex. And we'll do A, comma, B for complex. And let's run that and see what that does. And we get 5 minus 10J is how the output shows on that as a complex uh, number on there. And so I do a, a search for Python math. And let's stay in the 3 version. Let me just open that window up. And Mathematic Functions 3.7 Documentation. This is the official Python website with the documentation that shows all the different things when you use the math module. Math ceiling, math uh, copy sign, fabs, factorial. Scroll down here a little bit. It can be a little hard to read because it lists them what they do and how they return them. It's important, though, to get used to reading these because sometimes you go down here and you need to double check exactly what you're doing. Here's our math.pow for power. If you remember, we did that. There's our square root we did, log functions. There's tangent, cosine, or a cosine, a tangent, trigonometry uh, functions, tangent, degrees, hyperbolic function. We even have pi in here if you need to add pi in there. 
math.py. There's a lot of different things in here underneath the math module. And then, of course, we'll just go down to Wikibooks is probably okay. They're very simplistic. But you can see right here our basic functions in math and what we covered, a plus b, a minus b, a times b, a divided by b, floor division, uh, available in Python 2, 2, and later, Python 3, so that's not a problem. Ambersine is important because that's your remainder. I'm surprised how often I use it. I think I never use it, but I actually end up using that a lot. And of course, your negation, you can sub minus it, absolute value, and then we did the exponent a to the power of b. This is similar to the same thing as doing the math power. So you can also do a double times on here, and then the math square root of a. So you can come in here and see that just about anything you're looking for in algebra you're going to find it in these functions. And then we need to explore um, just a little bit, because we've been talking about a lot of functions on here and numbers. Let me just clear that out of there. What happens if I do print, and let's do the letter A plus 5. What do you think is going to happen there? We have the letter A plus the number 5. It's going to give us an error. It must be a string, not an integer. So it tells you what's wrong with it. It says, hey, you can't add the letter A to 5. I don't know what to do with that. And you'll get an error on there. And then let's do something a little fun with this. Let's write a little piece of code. Finding if a number is an Armstrong number. And I have to Google this. I didn't know what an Armstrong number was when they sent me the code. So what is an Armstrong number? An Armstrong number is an n-digit number that is equal to the sum of the nth powers of its digits. So it's kind of fun. That's, that's what an Armstrong number is. It's, I guess it's a common thing you can try out to find. Let's go ahead and do ours and see if we can figure that out. How do we write a code to compute if something is an Armstrong number? So we're going to go do an import math because we're going to be using the power. And I don't really have to import the math. I could actually use the time. Remember that uh, math.pow, or you can do the times times to also get the power. But we'll go ahead and do it under the math. So we'll import our math, importing another module. And then we'll have n equals integer. And we need an input, enter a number. So there's a lot of stuff going on in here. This here is two pieces of code put together. Input says, hey, I need to prompt you for something on the command line. Let's go ahead and run it, just this piece of code, and see what comes up. It says, enter a number. And then I can enter down below. You'll see what comes up in my run. Should prompt me to a number. And then this number, 20, and then it continues on. So when I enter the number, it's now assigning it to n. Let me add a space in there because it just looks better. And we'll just print in. Let's just do just this piece of code so you can see what's going on here. So run. Down below it says enter a number. I type in 20. I hit enter. And it prints 20. So now n is our variable. int means this is going to be of a data type integer. So if I run this and I type in 20.2, enter, it's going to give me an error because 20.2 is not an integer. It's a number, but it's got decimals. Quick note that this is forcing it to be an integer. And I flip over and say, what are the different number types in Python? You should be asking that question. And you'll see here, I always try to go to the main Python documentation whenever I can. Now you can reference other reference material, but you always want to go to the main reference. And the reason is is that it will give you what's actually in the Python and check your version and see what version you have on there. And so you have numerical types, integer, float, long, and complex are the common ones that we're going to be looking at. We're not going to cover all of these. Most of them are pretty straightforward. You know what an integer is versus just a regular number. A float value, long, means it just carries more digits. And then we can get into complex numbers, which we looked at briefly earlier. So we've learned how to input setup in here. And let's go ahead and the next step is to figure out what the length is. So how many digits are in this number? Well, let's do L equals. We want to do the length. Lin stands for length. And this has to be a string. So we haven't really talked much about strings, but a string is like the letter A was a string. It was a string of one letter. So we want to turn this into a string. You can just do str to tell it's going to be a string of n. So I've now computed the length of the string of n. And if we come up here, if you remember correctly, uh, we did print n. And let's print string of n on here. And you know what? Let's take this exit out of there and bring it down a notch. And let's just also do a comma L. So we're going to print it as a number, as a string, and as a length. And we'll do 20. You'll see that 20 is a number, 20 is a string. They look identical, and it's length 2. It's got two digits in it. Pretty straightforward. 
So, so far, we're pretty good. We're going to be adding up the powers of those. So it's important to get the length of the string of each one. And let's do number equals n, sum equals 0, and while number, ooh, a while loop. It's exciting. Remainder equals number. Then there's our amber sign. I think I mentioned that very briefly. By 10, a sum equals sum. I know I'm kind of flashing through this, so we're going to walk through this in just a second if you're getting lost and see what's going on. There we go. And number equals number 10. So this is the computation that's going to figure out, because we have n, our original value, and we've set number equal to n, and we have sum equals 0. So what's going on here is that we want to find out if the number we've picked, in this case 20, is an Armstrong number. So we're going to continually add the sum up of the power of the remainder. And when you're looking at this, you say remainder. Where does remainder come into this setup? Well, the remainder comes in here because when we divide by 10, so if I do, uh, let's do 22 divided by 10, you have a remainder of 2. We basically just pulled that last digit off. So it's just kind of a trick to pull the last digit off. And we're going to take that 2, and we're going to do 2 to the power of of, in this case, the length of L. So 2, in this case, is only power of 2. So L to the power of 2. Then we need to reset our number, and so this gives us the value of the number without the remainder. So we basically, this comment here, rem, gives us the remainder, so we're going to pop that off and use that to compute, add to our sum, and then we're going to take the number and we're going to set it back one. So while we have a number, we're going to keep doing this. So if we did 20, I'll pop the 0 off, and then I'll pop the 2 off, and then I'll say, hey, there's nothing left in number. It's empty. That's what this is doing. And then we have the sum. Sum equals sum plus math power. So we're adding it to itself. And you can actually do this. The shorthand for this, instead of doing sum plus, the shorthand for this in Python is plus equals math.power. So we're doing the rem to the power of the length. So this is a shorthand you can do. And by putting the plus sign before the equal sign, it just means we're adding it to the sum. Now, there are times when I do that, and there are times when my computations are so complex that I just get lost if I do that. It's okay to put it out here and just do sum equals sum plus math dot power. So now we've summed up all these values, and how do we know if it's an Armstrong? Well, we need an if. If sum equals n. So if they are equal, then we can print, let's do, yay! Armstrong, Armstrong number. Whenever I hear Armstrong, I always think of Neil Armstrong, for, you know, the first man on the moon. But yay, Armstrong number. Okay, so we got an Armstrong number. And this is an if statement in here, and else. You can do an if and an else, and else print. If we did yay, let's do boo. Just to be fun. This is not an Armstrong number. Baloo. Whoops. There we go. Boo. And a couple things to note here with the if, you'll see that instead of doing equals, sum has to have a double equals. Now, you can also do less than, greater than. We can do the exclamation point for not equals. But whenever you do equals, remember to put in two equal signs. This generates a yes or no, true, false. And if it's true, it will execute this next piece of code, which is indented. Python indentation is very important. Forgot to mention that with the while. You'll see the while automatically indented here. The same with the elf, if, and the same with the else. So it'll run the if the sum equals n, it'll print yay, Armstrong number. Else it'll print boo, this is not an Armstrong number. So we've written a nice little piece of code here. We've actually written the whole code. And let's go ahead and run this. And you'll see here's our number down here. We'll put in 20. I don't think 20 is an Armstrong number just because 2 to the power of 2 is 4. And it says, uh, boo, this is not an Armstrong number. And then we could also do, um, I'm not even sure how to get an Armstrong number, maybe 200? No, that wouldn't be an Armstrong number. Because I like to succeed, I went ahead and typed in Armstrong numbers, and I came up with, uh, looks like someone found one for 371. So let's go ahead and run this with 371, since we know that's an existing Armstrong number. 371. And Armstrong number 371. You could also type in, I found out that when I was playing with this the first time, I typed in one was the only one I could come up with on my own. I'm sure there's a lot of them. So yeah, we just read a simple code to predict if a number is an Armstrong number. Right here, it's a few lines of code. We have our input. So we learned about input. We learned about length, kind of our second short view of strings, which we're going to get more into. And then we did a while to loop through the number to find out, to add up and sum it, and then figure out if it's an Armstrong number. So we've covered a lot of things on numbers. Let's move on and take a look at strings. We've looked just a little bit at strings in here, so we're going to come back and take a look at strings. 
There we go. And let's go and put our comment in there that we're going to be working with strings. And let's create a couple of variables. We'll start with variable one equals, let's do welcome. And I'm going to add a space in there. And then we'll do variable two. And we'll set that equal to simply learn. So when you're working with variables, if you noticed uh, earlier, we did um, a plus five. And we ran that and it gave us an error because you can't add a string to a number. It doesn't know what to do with it. So there's two things I want you to notice here. One, we've assigned variable strings. And then we're going to take the variables. We're going to do variable one plus variable two. So I've assigned variable one welcome and variable two assigned to simply learn. And when we do variable one plus variable two and we run it, we get welcome to simply learn. And I had to add the space in there because it takes the strings. It doesn't really, there are ways to track spaces in the string and do things with that. But the basic variable doesn't know to add a space in there. So if I do this, it'll be uh, welcome to. And you'll see there's no space between the two and the welcome. So we got to make sure we add that space in there when we're working with variables. And so this is simple. We just printed uh, variable one and variable two. This concatenates the two variables together, just like you think it would. And it's important that the term concatenation is very common. It means that we're adding a second one in line to the first one. So you're not going to get two simply learn welcome, unless you switch the two around, of course. And we can do other things. We can do print variable. And then we're going to do, let's see, let's do variable two. And we're going to do brackets. And we haven't talked about brackets because the string is an array. We're actually going to get into arrays later on. So it's important to note this is an array of letters. And we do zero to three. And so we have our indexes. Our index is zero and our index of three. And let me go ahead and print this so you can see what's going on. And it prints just T-O. Two. And if we did variable one, that's kind of fun, and we run that, and it prints well, W-E-L. So the indices have zero. Zero refers to the first position, and that's true of all your scripting languages. And so we have zero, one, two, and you would think, well, why doesn't it print three in there? Let me just do this because it's kind of fun to say we. So if I do variable zero to two, that should be zero, one, two. It doesn't include the last position in the array. And that's very important to note. And there's a lot of reasons reasons for that programmatically. But we are creating a slice. So this is a slice from 0 to less than 2, uh, which in this case is 0, 1, which is we. And then we can also print, let's do variable, let's do 2, and we'll do it this way, 3 on. Let's run that. And you'll see that this prints simply learn. Well, how did I get simply learn from there? Well, we have 0, 1, 2, and then I start at 3. That's the S. And by leaving this one blank, it goes all the way to the end. That's all this says is 3 to the end. And I can do that also with the first one. And put, instead of putting 0 to 2, I could do just everything up to 2. And I still get the we, W-E, down here. And if I do 3 on, I get 3 on, which is simply learn. And of course, if we did no numbers on here, let me just do that separately. It does occur, believe it or not, but it's usually not something you use very often. You would show everything. That's all it does is here's our variable 2 to simply learn. So it prints all of it on there. And then earlier, we already did this, but we'll do it again. Print link, L-E-N for length. And we'll do variable, let's do variable one. And so when we run that, it comes down here and says it's eight long. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Don't forget that blank space has to be counted. In variable one, we have eight letters in there. And again, we did that earlier when we did our um, Armstrong number. So that should look familiar. And then you can also look up an index. So we're going to print variable dot index and we'll look up com and these are very common things we do we search through the words to find things so this is a built-in method of strings and we'll run this and it's going to print the index of com except they forgot to put variable one so it's giving me a little bit of error there so let's run it uh, we'll see three is the index of the c so zero one two three for C, um, C-O-M. And I could easily do M-E, I could do just the letter C, and I'll go through and find the first index of C. With strings, this is a little bit weird um, because you almost have to be really specific with whatever you're trying to do. But we'll go Python string functions, which will take us to, uh, let's go to the official site. I always try to go to the official site. Uh, in this case, 3.6, this is what we're in, or 2.7 isn't going to matter too much because uh, it's been around so long. And you can see here's all of our string and common string operations. Converting it to digits, letters, lower 
lowercase. There's so many things in here. You can do uppercase, white space, formatting, which we're going to look at in just a minute. There's a lot of things you can do with strings. So you have to be a little bit more specific with whatever it is you're trying to do. And chances are there's a quick way to do it that you can look up. So what we're going to do, though, is we're going to take a look at some of these, just a few of these, just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do. But one of the things for readability that's so important and actually, you know what, let me go ahead and start this over a little bit here. So clean my palette a little bit. We're going to create a variable equal to, and I'm going to do the single asterisk, but I'm going to do three of them. And you'll see in the PyCharm format, it automatically creates two sets of three. And this is a very useful when you're writing code because what it does, it says, hey, anything between these two sets of three single asterisks is going to be a string variable. So I can do welcome and I can do two, and I can do Python, and then I can print variable. And let's go ahead and run that and see what that looks like. Scroll up just a little bit here. A couple things to know. First off, we split our string on three different lines, so it's much more readable. If you're doing a lot of programming, you might have a very lengthy thing going on where you're doing the path or something like that, where you really want it spread out so you can see what's going on. And it's also important to note that it added a carriage return. It registers that carriage return as part of the string. So when it prints it out, you'll see welcome to Python as three separate lines. And that's why you can't see the carriage return here or the line break, but it's in there. And that's when we print this variable, that's what you're going to get. But you can split it in multiple lines. It makes it a little bit more readable. So let me clear this out again. That way we keep a nice big screen going so it's a little, hopefully easier to read. Let's talk just a little bit about formatting. There's a lot of different things you can do with formatting. Let's go ahead and create name equals Sam place equals Florida variable equals. So we're going to create a variable. And this one's going to be hi. And I'm going to create brackets followed by an exclamation point. That's a place. Uh, so the brackets are important. They actually register in the variable as being something other than brackets. And then we can do welcome to, we'll add another set of brackets and a period at the end so we have proper punctuation. And I'm going to format this. And we're going to format this with name and place. And what this is doing is maybe you're printing out labels. So maybe this is a full address or something like that. So what's fun about this is I can do print and I print out my variable and we run this. And you can see that it's replaced the first set and the second set of brackets with Sam and Florida. So we have a nice, hi Sam, welcome to Florida. This is kind of fun because we can actually take these brackets and let's say the order is different. Let's do one and zero. And remember when we're talking about counting, we always start with zero. So name is in the zero place, place is in the one place. And if you can guess what we just did, we said, hi Florida, welcome to Sam. Another way to do place holders is um, with the amber sign and let's also mix in an input I know we already did inputs before but we'll do it again so we're inputting a uh, from a user so we'll do name equals input enter your name and then we can do a scoop in or backward slash in I always call it scoop in because that's I always remember I've never remember backward slash I remember scoop in for some reason this is your carriage return if you wanted to print an actual backward slash it'd be backslash backslash so this is how you print a backward backslash or enter a backslash as a variable so with double backslash because the backslash is an escape character so whatever comes after it gives it special meaning and in this case a backward slash followed by the n is the same as a carriage return so it puts in a new line and we're setting name equal to input into your name. And if you remember, we did a number earlier just like that. We said enter a number, and we set it equal to an integer, and we set it to a variable. So it's the same thing. We're just entering a string this time. Now we can do print hi space. Remember, it doesn't register space, name. And if I run this, uh, I'll say enter your name. And my name happens to be Richard. So I'll enter Richard. It says, hi, Richard. Exciting there. And notice the spacing on here. Why does it have the extra spacing? Well, we put a comma in, so a comma separates everything. I could have just as easily added my two strings together and run it this way, make sure I have my space after the high, and I run it this way, and now I'll just have, put my name in there again, enter, hi Richard, just the single space on here. So it changes the spacing. Sometimes it gets confusing because the comma, like I said, is just a basic tab in between, I believe is what it does. So we have print, hi Richard, in this case. We could also do do with formatting print so we're going to do print again and here's our hi and then I'm going to put the amber sign s period is punctuation but the amber sign s is what's important 
how are you? Question mark. And then because it's a marker, we can then add it afterwards as an amber sign. And this used to be so common. I saw this all the time. So part of it, you're going to say, how come we don't just use the brackets and use this instead? This used to be the standard. They introduced that as also another standard. And so both of them work quite well. And you can see we do name. So that's our placeholder in there for the name. And if we run this, it's going to ask me to enter name, Richard, enter. Hi, Richard, how are you? And then from before, if you remember, we entered a number. So we're going to do age equals, and we'll make it be an integer. How old are you? And let's do input, and then we need the prompt for the input. Enter your age, and I guess we're going to make the enter it on the next line down. And then we'll print you are Here's our placeholder with the amber sign. There we go. We'll call it amber sign D, year old. Bracket. And then we'll do amber sign H to put that in there. So here we have U R, and then here's our placeholder, year old, and then the age. And um, we'll go ahead and run this so you can see that. It says enter your name. So we'll go down here. We enter my name, Richard. Hi, Richard. Hi, Richard. How are you? And then we're going to enter my age. And they say you're only as young as you feel. And today I'm feeling 30, which is well below my actual age. But we'll do 30 today. I'm actually in my 30. So you are 30 years old. So you can see how we reformatted the setup on here. And we've now printed out using two different forms of place markers. And this brings us to lists. What are we going to do? We're going to do lists, dictionaries, lists, dic well, tuples first. Tuples, we'll explore while loops, and we'll get into dictionaries and other fun stuff. So we'll start with list. List is the most basic collection of items in the Python language. Now in other languages you might hear references to an array. There's a lot of different names, but list is the proper terminology. And we'll go ahead and just call it LST for our variable. So we're going to set a variable LST equal to our list. And a list is set up with square brackets. And then you can put your objects in here separated by commas. And you'll see here we have one, two, three, four, five. And we can even mix and match our data types. So in Python, you have a lot of leeway. So you can see here we have uh, one, two, three, four, comma, simply learn. So we have an item with uh, has five items in it. And a list, we looked at this just a little bit when we looked at strings, because remember, a string is also a list. So this is a list of numbers and a sublist of a string, which is also a list of characters. And we'll look at that just a little bit more closely here in a second. From here, we can do a print, and there's our variable, LST, and then we can reference it. Just like we did above, we use the square brackets, and I can say reference 2. That's going to be the second position, and if you guess that that is equal to 3, you're correct, because we always start with 0. 0, 1, 2 puts us in the 3 mark right there. So this is our basic list, and you can see we have our basic index referencing the list, and just like we did before, we can also do negative. So this could be a list minus minus 4, and if we're doing minus 4, let's go ahead and run that. You'll see 3 for our index of 2, and then 2 is our index of minus 4. So counting this one from this end, that's minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. And this is interesting. There's a reason they do this. When you start writing programs to reference different aspects of this list, you'll find that it makes a lot more sense. Minus 0 is nothing. So it always starts going backwards at minus 1, because minus 0 equals 0, so it's still always going to equal 1. So you can't really make it a minus 0. So we start with minus 1, minus 2, 3, and 4 puts us at the 2 point. And there are a number of properties to the list that gives us all kinds of control of it. List dot append. And we'll append a 3 to it. Lists are dynamic, meaning we can change the contents and we can add to it and subtract from it. So if we list append 3, and then we go ahead and print our list. Let's just take, we'll reset this so we're not, not collecting a lot of things on here. So if we print our list, we now have 1, 2, 3, 4, simply learn, and 3. So there's our list. And it continues to grow. Also note, we've repeated. We have two threes in here. So there's no, um, there's nothing in here that says that they have to be unique. There's ways to do that, but in a basic list, they don't have to be unique, and they're just indexed by their location. And we can do list.remove, so you can remove. We'll put in simply learn. And if we do this, and then we print our list again, 
that we run that, you can see that we have one, two, three, four, simply learn three. We've removed the value out of there of simply learn, and we end up with one, two, three, four, three. And we can also do a reverse. We could just skip the setting list changes. We could do print list dot verse. And let's run that. And you'll see, oops, it came out one. I messed up on there. List reverse. We can do a list reverse, and if we print list and we run that, we end up with 34321 three, going in reverse. And when there's also a sort on here, so we can do list.sort. And if we print list, let's run that. You can see we've sorted it out, one, two, three, three, four. So let's put it in order. And this would also work alphabetically. So if you had um, apple, banana, and whatever else, it would organize it by apple and banana, or one, two, three, four. Um, kind of a fun thing. Let's just see what happens where it puts Simply Learn in here. We'll take list and go back to our original one and sort that and run it, and it gives us an error. So what happens is it doesn't know how to compare strings and integers. So this is important to note that even though you can do all kinds of things with your list and you can put multiple different objects in the list, you have to remember that whatever uh, logic is going on still has to be able to work on both letters and numbers on there. And if I pop in list operations in Python and do a quick search, you actually have to scroll down a little bit to get to the official site, python.org, data structures, and list overflow. And we go underneath this, actually I found that 2.7 had the one into it, but I'm sure there's a 3.6 and 3.7 version in here. We look at data structures and you can see that list really is one of the basic objects in Python. So you can append, we just looked at that, you can extend it, you can insert it, you can remove, we did that one. There's a pop and a push, there's an index, a count, a sort, reverse. There's all kinds of things you can do and you can scroll down and you'll see there's different categories and ways that they function. And I would suggest for this going to the Python main site because this is the actual API on here. This is actually what you're accessing. And let's go ahead and introduce the basic iteration through a list or a loop. And the basic loop is always a for loop and um, in Python you can do for i in list. And then what we can do, there's an indent, my editor automatically puts the indent in there, is we can go ahead and just print list. And so, oops, not list. I'll just print a bunch of the list over and over again. We want to print I. And so when we do this, and we go ahead and run this, and let's go ahead and pull up our um, output down here so you can see it, we end up with one, two, three, four, five. It just goes through the list and takes an action on each one. Now, if you came from another programming language, or if you're some of the older languages way back in the 90s, you would have to do something more like this, range zero, length, of list. So you have a starting point, remember it always starts in zero, and the range command only goes up two but does not include the last value, which is going to be the length. So length of this is five, but the last value is going to be four. It's going to be zero to four. And instead of print i, we're going to print list and I'll put square brackets around the I, just like we did before for indexing. And you'll see it gives us the same answer. One, two, three, four, five. So there's reason to do it with a range and there's reason to not do it generally, when you're doing a for loop or iterating through your data, for i in list is the most basic format and the most Pythonic format because it's very easy to read. And you know that you're just going to print i because i now represents each of those values. And knowing how to iterate through things is so important in Python. Along with the tuples and lists, and um, and this works by the way as if this was a tuple or a list. Um, I could just as easy have created a tuple. Let's just do that real quick so you can see. Control copy, TPL equals. So here's our tuple in circular brackets, and I can do I and tuple. And we should get the same output, and you can see we do 1, 2, 3, 4. So it works just the same as it does in a list. The difference is, is I can't go back and change a tuple. I couldn't say tuple of position 3, change that to 9. They'll throw an error. But we can certainly print and go through our tuple just like we do through the list on here. Let me just put that back. List, let's go run. There we go. And there's a lot of other things we can do with the list. You can make a list of lists. So we could have in our list, let's do it this way, one, two, three, comma, we'll do four, five. So not even the same link. List doesn't care about that unless you um, add some extra things in there to make it force it into the right size. And we'll go A, B, so we have a totally different data type in this list, C. So you can see here we have some very different aspects, and we'll just print the list and run that. And you'll see we get the same list down here, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, A, B, C. 
And just like we did this before, if we take this list, we can do for i in list. So there's our i. We just do tab, and we could print the i like we did before. So it'll print each of the sublists in here. And you can see we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, A, B, C. We could even do something, go down a level. We could do for J in I, because I is now also a list or a sublist. And we have to end in our print. And we'll do print J. And if we do that, you'll see it comes uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, A, B, C. It just flattens it out and prints each digit one at a time on there. And let's go ahead and reset our list to a single list. So we got one, two, three, four, five. Get rid of all this. Here's our four i. We'll keep our four i. Change this. Just a very basic logic. The if else statement. So we can do if i, and we're going to look at the remainder. What it looks like when it's divided by two. So if it's uh, seven divided by two, you're going to have a remainder of one. If it's six divided by two, you have a remainder of zero. So if i remainder 2, or the remainder of i divided by 2, equals 0, put our colon here, make sure you have your indent, and if there's uh, no remainder on here, let's print, let's see what we can do here, we have, uh, oh, let's do um, our placeholder, so we have formatted text is even, and then we'll do placeholder, so we know that this is going to go there, i. So print if this is even, placeholder i. Double check, okay. And uh, they'll do an else. So if it's uh, not even, then it's going to be what? Odd. And we'll do the whole thing again. I'll just copy this. There we go. Print is odd. And then we have a placeholder i. Now let's see what this looks like when we run it. Just a quick way to iterate through the data. So we're iterating through the data. If it has no remainder divided by 2, then it's got to be even. And if it does have a remainder, else it's odd, even or odd. And uh, hopefully you caught it. I was uh, so busy typing it in, I didn't catch the dollar sign I accidentally hit. Fix that. And now we go ahead and run it. And we have uh, 1 is odd, 2 is even, 3 is odd, 4 is even, 5 is odd. Just like we expected. 5 is an odd number. Now earlier, I hinted at tuple a little bit. Kind of jump the gun there. You create a tuple by putting brackets around. Instead of square brackets, you use the curved brackets. That denotes it's a tuple. Now a tuple, in a lot of respects, it's a sub-object of list. So it has a lot of the same things you have in list. Print the tuple down here. You'll see one, two, three, four, five, and it has the curved brackets around it. I can go in here, and uh, if you remember from before, I can print we do this, let's go print tuple, and we'll use an index, index of 3. I guess I didn't need to retype all that, I could have just done the index of 3. And the index of 3 is 4, because we go 0, 1, 2, 3, and this puts us at the 4 value. So it's the same index. We can't sort it, we can't reverse it, we can't change it. I can't come in here, if you remember if we had a list, with a list, I could come in here and say list of 2 equals lucky seven. There we go. And if I print the list, you'll see down here that it has one, two, seven, four. But if I do this with the tuple, let's take the tuple here. Let me take off my index. So it doesn't print just the index. And we'll do list. Instead of the list, let's do the tuple of two equals seven. And if I run that, it's going to give me an error. Why? Because we can't change a tuple. Um, I can change the overall value. I can come down here and say, okay, the tuple's worth this. Now my variable tuple is worth A, or one, let's do A, B, C. So I can change the tuple variable, but I can't change anything in the tuple. And let me run that and see, I still get an error because I have my um, tuple 2 equals 7. Let's run that without that. And you'll see it's now worth A, B, C, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But if I try to change a digit in there, and when you do a reverse or a sort or anything like that on the list, it actually changes the individual variables. And this is also true if I have a list of lists. Let me do my list equals. Oh, let's do uh, one, two, three, comma. And we'll make this a tuple, four, five, six. I can change these aspects of the list, the one, two, three, and I can change out the position number one, index one, which is a four, five, six, but I can't change anything in the four, five, six. So if I print list, uh, it'll come out down here as one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you said, let me run it, that's going to give me an error, you're correct. And the reason is this object here is an array and an array can be changed. Because that array can be changed, it can't be a member of a tuple. So for a tuple, you have to have subs of tuples. 
Uh, you can see here one, two, three then works as a tuple of a tuple. So you can do subtuples of tuples. And you can do subtuples of lists. And it even lets you do a sub list of a tuple, but don't ever do this because this is going to cause problems if you're using an array and you have another variable pointing to this array, you're going to have problems. Once a tuple is set, you can't change anything in the tuple without causing an error. Now we've talked a little bit about uh, lists and tuples and we talked about a basic iteration loop. Let's go ahead and look at a while loop and let's create some variables. We'll do a uh, number equals integer input enter a number. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a variable called number. We're going to force it to be an integer. So it has to be 1, 2, 3, 4. It can't be 1.5. And the input is going to prompt us. It's going to prompt us to enter in a number on here for our while loop. And then let's go ahead and take this number and we're going to say i equals number. And what we're going to do is we're going to show how to teach you how to find the factorial. We're going to do with this little one. Let's do a fact equals 1. So our factorial is going to start as 1. And then we're going to say while i is greater than or equal to 1, we're going to loop through. So as long as i is greater than or equal to 1, as long as this is true, as long as this logic is correct, we're going to keep going through this loop. And you'll see it has an automatic indent here. And then we'll do our fact, which is 1, equals fact times i. Now I went ahead and wrote this out fact equals fact times i. But the Pythonian way is since we're using the same variable and doing simple math on it is to do fact equals i. And this is the same thing. Fact equals itself times i. That's what this setup works here. And we'll do the same thing with i. We're going to do i minus equals 1. So i equals itself minus 1. And you could easily just have written this out as i minus 1. It's the same thing. That's the same thing. But we like to make it look nice and clean. So we'll do uh, i minus equals 1. And let's go down here and let's go ahead and print out our factorial. And then we'll walk through the factorial. Let's print in our second placeholder. And then we have our two placeholders, which is going to be number comma factorial. And just a quick note here, curved brackets. So we are looking at a tuple right here. Once, and it's only used in this one line, so once it's done here, it's gone. But this is actually read as a tuple because it's got the curved brackets around it. So we basically start by taking our number and we're going to run it. And it's going to prompt us to enter a number. So we'll go ahead and enter the number four. And then each time through the loop, if as long as i equals number, so i equals the 4 equals the num, and we could have just left it as num. We could have just kept taking it, but we wanted to use that for printing later on. So for the factor of, and remember number is. So we take i equals number, and then each iteration it subtracts 1. And so we take 4, we start off with a factorial of 1, 4 times 1 is 4, subtract 1, 3 times 4 is 12, subtract 1, 2 times 12 is 24, subtract 1, 1 times 24 is 24. Hopefully they did that right. So when we run this, go back down here, hit the enter key, there we go. The factorial of 4 is 24. So that is the same as 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, or in this case they did it in reverse, we went 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So a quick way to find the factorial of a number. You can see though that you could insert just about any logic depending on what you're working on. And it will keep going through the loop until this particular logic is met. And you can imagine that something that had no logic to it whatsoever, if I did something like this where I did while 0 equals 0, it would do this loop forever. It would never come out of the loop. And eventually you'll get an error. I'm not going to do it because it takes it a, a few minutes to get an error down here, but you get an error saying it iterated to the loop and had a while loop that never broke. So you got to be a little careful when you're using the while loop when doing this, just because you could end up with this error coming up and your program locking up, and then you got to go troubleshoot it and find out what you did wrong. You can see if you did instead of zero, maybe you're in a rush, you go with, well, when i equals i or something like that, or maybe i equals, well, i change it. So if I did number, it would actually go away. But if I did i equals i. That would be an issue. Now we already looked at nested loops where we had the i and the j. We went through two different series. Some of the things to be aware of when you're doing these, I showed you a range, but we can put that together. And I can do for, we enter in a number and I can do for i in reversed. So we can put a command word in there. And it's going to reverse whatever is in here. And if you remember I had range as one of my options. One comma in plus one. The reason we're doing this particular setup is most of our arrays start at zero. 
but let's say I actually want to print out the numbers. Well, I want to start with 1. Range goes up to n. So if this is like 5, it will go up to 4. So we have to add the plus 1 in in the range. So we have here new word we've added in. We have our range I showed you earlier. And so we have i in range, whatever number we put it. And you can create a nested loop for j in range 1 comma i plus 1. So now we're going to go forward in the loop. And let's just do print. Oh, we'll just do i comma j. So we'll print out our two variables. And let's go ahead and run that. And it's going to have me enter a number. I'll keep it small so it doesn't fill up my screen. We'll just do 3. And you can see it starts with reversed 1 to 3, but in this case it goes 3 to 1. 3, 2, 2, 1. And the reason it does this is if you look at this, we have our 3, and then we have a nested loop going the other way. This one goes 1 to i plus 1. So in this case, I did 1 to i, which is 3. And if you do the logic on this, you can actually see how it comes up. We end up with 3, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1. So you can do a loop here, because here's our 3. It's hard to follow sometimes when you do these loops in reverse. You'll see here we get 3, 1, because i is 3, and then i plus 1. We have i starts with range 1, so this is going forward. So we have 1, 2, 3. So that's the j. And then we get i equals 2, and we get j equals 1. 1, 2, and then we get i equals 1 and j equals 1. And surprisingly enough, this stuff actually comes up. If you're just starting off in programming and you're looking at this going, oh my gosh, that's a little confusing. I certainly have done some logic and data analysis where I'm looking at it and I have to track it down and make sure it's getting all the different combinations I want. And I'll end up with some kind of pattern like this. And it does get confusing. So, you know, if you didn't follow that right off the bat, take a little time and just kind of figure out the logic. Not a big deal, but it does come up. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this. We have one more major data structure to cover, which is dictionaries. You know, we had lists, we had tuples. We've looked at our basic um, iteration loop and our while loop. We've seen nested loops. We're going to take just a little detour here before we come to dictionaries. And we're going to look at functions. Very important. Clear this out of here. So if you remember way back when we started this, I discussed the fact that you don't want to be copying and pasting and redoing your code over and over again. So instead of doing that, let me do an import here, math, because we can do a, have a little math in there. We're going to create what's called a function. And in Python, you use the word def, D-E-F, stands for definition. And we might call this circle R. So what we have here is a name I've given it. I've given it the name circle. We've labeled it as a definition, so you know that this is going to be a function. And we have a variable that goes into the definition. So when I call this definition, I'm going to send it the variable r. And then when I come in here, we'll go area equals math.pi. One of the things you can do with math is just pull up the value of pi times. And if you remember correctly, we have power r comma 2. We could also just do this for our power. We could also do r star star 2. They actually do the same thing. I always like to put the brackets around it just so we know that this is, it will do this automatically if you remember from your algebra. You do your powers first before you do multiplications and that kind of thing. But I still like to put brackets around it just for my own readability. So we have the r squared times pi that gives us the area. And the perimeter, we'll call it peri, equals 2 times, if I remember correctly, it's uh, math.pi times r. So this gives us our parameter. 2 times pi times the radius. And then we'll go ahead and just do a return area and parameter. So what we can do with this is if I, let's just do, we'll call it a and p equals circle, and we'll have a circle of a radius of 4. And if we do a print a comma p, and I run this, you'll see down here that it actually prints out the area at 50.26, whatever it is, and 25.13, whatever it is. So this way, if we have like a number of different evaluations we're doing, I've just created a function circle that computes the area and the perimeter, and then we can just print it out. And I can reuse this over and over again. I don't have to copy and paste these two lines of code in here. I can just call this function up, and it will bring this answer in for me. And we could certainly do this not just for a circle. We could also have definition triangle, and triangle has three sides. So we have three distances, and we have area equals math square root. And if you remember from your geometry, oops, I forgot to step on here, s equals 0 0.5 times a plus b plus c. And then if we take the um, half the sum, 
we can then do s times s, let's put our brackets in here, s minus a. And this you have to have brackets on because otherwise it'll do s times s minus a versus s times s minus a. And we're going to multiply this, s minus b, and we'll multiply that, s minus c. And this would give us the area of the triangle. And the perimeter of the triangle is simply a plus b plus c. And we can return area comma perimeter. So just like the circle, we've now created a triangle. And then we can also do this for rectangles a little bit easier. Def rectangle. I guess we'll do L comma B. There's our colon at the end. Indent. Make sure you have that indent in there. And uh, area equals L times B. And the perimeter, perimeter equals 2 times L plus B. And then we can return area comma perimeter. With the definition you don't have to return something. I'm actually showing you a couple things here where we're returning two values. So I, you could return one value, you could have no return on here, it could just be doing a print, it could be saving it to file. So you can do all kinds of things with these. You're not limited to returning two variables. And so you can see in here um, we have our definition circle, our definition triangle, and our definition rectangle, and each one returns area and perimeter. Had a couple little errors in here real quick, fix those. So we have our our three functions and now we want to do something with them. We've kept some unity there so they're repeating themselves but all returning the area and the perimeter but each one needs different information. So to do that let's go ahead and get an input and I'm going to just do in for input. You've seen this before we have an integer we're going to input select our scoop in which is a carried return and then we'll have one for circle, a new line, two for triangle, three for rectangle and then a new line to enter our information in. Now we want to do something with that, so to do something with that, we'll use the if statement. We'll do if n equals 1, and there's our colon afterwards. Remember two equal signs, if you're doing a logic, they need the two equal signs. And if it's a circle, we're going to do r equals, oh, and let's do a float value. Now float, remember integers like uh, 1, 2, 3, float, 1.2, 4.5, so on. We'll do input. Enter radius. Hit enter on there. And then we do area and perimeter equals. And we don't have to copy all the calculations for it because we already have that up above. Circle of R. Now we have it returning two variables. You could have it return one variable, you could have it not return a variable. Maybe it just prints something or saves it to file. In this case, we're going to just return one variable for the circle. And we'll go ahead and just run this just because we can. And if I go down here and I type in one, uh, it says inner radius five, and then it does nothing with that. So we want to actually do something with this. And what we're going to do is we're going to print. And just like before, we have our area, we're going to use a placeholder, our ambersign F, scoop in, perimeter, scoop F, ambersign, and then our two values that go into the two placeholders. And so if we run this, and we select down here, triangle, and it says enter the radius, we'll do a radius 3, enter, and then down here you'll see that it prints out the area is 28.274334, the parameter is 18.849956. Uh, so it prints out our area and our perimeter pretty good on here. Let's go back, because we did just the triangle, so it needs to know what happens if it is not a triangle, but instead is a, I mean not a circle, but instead is a triangle. So we have an LF. If n equals 1, well, we can do an else if, but it's LF is the command on there. We do our colon, but we want n equals 2. And so if n equals 2, we're going to go ahead and, if you remember correctly from that, we had the three sides of a triangle, a, b, and c. So we'll do a equals. I like the float, so we'll keep the float in there as a float value, just in case someone wanted to do a float. And we'll do enter side 1. Just copy and paste that down there. And because I'm lazy, I'm going to do another copy and paste. B equals, and of course when you do copy and paste, your error carries all the way down if you mistype something. Side 2, and then we also want C equals, and this is going to be side 3. There we go. And then we need to generate our area and our perimeter, and that equals triangle A, B, C. And remember that from above. So when you're coming up here, here's our circle. It takes one value. I didn't have to call it R. We could have called it anything. R is, it's a radius, so it's pretty easy to track that R would be the best choice for that. Unless you have something else that starts with R, you might have to add in rad for radius or something like that. The triangle has the three sides, so we did A, B, C. 
and then the rectangle we did breadth by length. So we'll keep that up here. We'll have A, B, C for our three sides of our triangle, and then there's our area. And we can go ahead and even just run this. So here we go. Where's my double error? So can, there we go. So you can see what's going on. And here's our triangles two. I was going to say inner side one. So we'll enter in uh, two, side two of three, four, and so on. And it computes the area and the perimeter, 2.9047 or 9.0 for the perimeter. And then if you continue the logic, we're going to do just a little different here. We could do another else if. If we did another else if and you entered a number that was not one, two, or three, it would not generate an area or a perimeter, but it would still try to print them. Uh, so we'll just do a catch all. We'll say else. And if else is here, then we need, um, what, breadth equals inner side 1. Again, when you do copy-paste, remember everything you copy and paste will um, show up to haunt you. A lot of times people will actually retype all their code instead of doing what I'm doing, just to avoid that. So we have our breadth and our length, input and our side, and we'll go ahead and do area and perimeter equals, and this is the rectangle. L comma B is fine. It doesn't matter what the order is for a rectangle. And now we can run this, and when we run this, bring this back up so you can see what's going on, we select one, two, or three, and this could actually be three, four, five, or six, because we did an L statement instead of an LF. But we'll go ahead and type in three, inner side one, five, inner side two, ten, and you can see here it's going to be a perimeter of 30 and an area of 50. You know, 10 times 5 is 50, and 5 plus 5 plus 10 plus 10 is 30. So, you know, it's a cute little code, and we've looked at how to create definitions, and we've looped that in with our if statement. We have an LF, which we've added in, and then our catch-all else statement. So, what we're going to do next is we're going to go back. If you remember before, we were talking about, clear this out. We talked about lists, we talked about tuples, and we are now at... What is a dictionary? So a dictionary uses what we call key value pairs. And when we had the list, remember our list equals, we'll just do this real quick. The list has one, two, three, four. And if I print list of two, this index is the key for a list. So a list has keys. And the keys are basically 0, 1, 2, 3. So 0, 1, 2 is a number 3. And that's where we get printed out here. This is the key. This index is the key for a list. Well, well, in a dictionary, we create our own keys. And so I might do months. So here's our value of months. And we denote a dictionary with brackets. So this lets me know that this is going to be a dictionary. And we actually put one together. I tend to find that when I'm doing dictionaries, I end up with very large dictionaries because I'm usually covering a lot of information. But let's say we're doing the months and we want to know the days of the months. We can now create a key value, in this case January, and the day's 31. And if you remember from our list, let's go back here and see list equals, I keep redoing this, I should have just left it, 7, 8, 9. So from here I can do print list of 0, which is going to be the first place. When we run that, we get 7. With months, if I want to print, I can print months. There's our variable. Here's our square brackets, just like a list. But instead, I'm going to put in January. And so this is now our key here. And let's run that. And you'll see it prints out 31. And we can iterate through our months just like we did before. So let's do for M. I'm going to stick with key for key and months. And I'm going to have it print the key. And then I'm going to have it print months of the key. And let's go ahead and run this. And so we'll see here that it prints the key January 31st, February 28th, and so on, followed by the months. And of course, we can make this kind of a fancy it up a little bit, adding a um, four. Let's do a placeholder string day count is. And then we'll add our placeholder back here. And let's just take this and we'll put a bracket around it real quick. That way we have our nice format going too, so it looks nice. And hopefully I didn't miss something when I run this. I got a name error, so let's fix that. And we run this, and we'll see we get for January, the day count is 31. For February, day count is 28. And oh, wait a second. What if it was a leap year? Well, with months, we can go in here, and here is our value. We'll just copy February on over. And in a leap year, February has... 29 days. So I can now change months February to 29 and we can run this. And now we see January is now 29. So the takeaway from this is the dictionary is kind of like a subset of list. It functions very much like a list in that the value 
can also be another dictionary, it can be tuples, it can be a list, it can be an array, which we're going to cover in just a minute, a string, characters, numbers, integers, float value. You can put almost anything in the value, just like you can put anything in a list. The big thing is the key. This key can't be changed. I can't go in and change it. I can delete the key and add a new key in, but I cannot change the key. And this is important because I might have a key, my key equals, let's call it November comma December. So here's my key. I'm going to create a new value in here and I can do months and my key equals, I'm going to make this equal to months November plus months, I'll make this December. So what I'm doing is I'm adding the days from both months. And let me close this because I put it in the wrong spot put it here after January. So I've added in here November, December. And if you look at this as a key code. So I've created a key code out of a tuple. Remember a tuple can't be changed. So you'll see this in key codes where you might have a number of different values that are your index for your dictionary. And tuples are used a lot in dictionaries because you might have multiple values that are locked in and very important. I don't know how many times I've done word counts in documents. Like you might be going through the document and looking up how many times does January occur in all the bills passed for the United States in the last year. And it has January as the word, and then the count goes here. It goes and count, it occurred once, twice, three, and it just keeps incrementing that as it goes through and looks up the, how many words are in that document. Uh, so you can use this for a lot of things, but dictionaries, it's important to know that you have your key and you have your value. And you can change the value, but you can't change the key. And the value can also be, like I said, a dictionary. It can also be a list. It can be a tuple. It can be a string. It's whatever you need it to be. And this brings us to one more data type. So we've had list, we've had tuples, we've had the dictionary. We're now going to do the actual array. Now I mentioned earlier that, and this is one of the confusions in Python if you're coming from another programming language, there is the list and then there is an array. The array is probably more close to what you actually think of of an array if you're programming in Java or C++ or another programming script uh, because it's typeset. Now remember I can put a string in here in the list, I can put an integer, put whatever data type I want in the list. I can put a sublist in the list. But with an array, you can't do that. So we're going to do from array import. We're going to import all our different code from the array. So we're importing the module. In this case, we're importing all the parts of array. You could just do import array here for what we're doing. And we'll create a variable. We'll call it ARR. And we'll set that equal to an array. We're going to type set it. That's what the I is. It actually stands for integer. In this case, signed integer. And then we'll send it a list. The list might be minus one, two, three, minus four, five. Now the array inherits from the list. So almost all the functionality you have in the list is the same for the array. The difference is we've typeset it. We force this to be integer only. Like I can go in here and I can go print ARR. Oh, let's just do, let's do zero just because. There we go. If I print the ARR of zero, it's negative one. So just like an array, it's going to go to this point. We can also do ARR of zero equals, let's make it minus 99. And if I run that, you'll see it now equals 99. But what happens if I do 99.999 and we run that, it's going to give me an error. Why? Because I've told it it can only take integers. So this is locked in and it doesn't allow me to put anything else other than a signed integer. Now if we go to our Bing search, do Python 3 array type. And the reason I say to do array type is because you'll get a lot of different returns for just array. And you'll want to go down to where you see the official docspython.org um, and you can go straight to 3 library and see what it has on there. But this is the best way to do it. Well, not the best way. This is one way to do it. A lot of people just go straight to the Python site and look it up. And you'll see that they have a list of all the different arrays you can have. And here is our I signed integer. You can do all kinds of different things from float to double to unsigned character and signed character and short. And if you scroll down, you can type the, you can see what type of array it is, type code, item size. There's our append straight from the list. Extend from bytes, from file, from list. There's Unicode. There's our index. So we can pull up the array index. We can insert. By the way, you can insert in a regular list. Pop, remove, same thing as on the list. So it's pretty much the same as the list. There's a few other things in here that you can do, and there's a few things you can't do. 
Obviously, one of them is signed a non-integer value in here. So we've covered a lot. We've covered uh, list tuples, dictionaries, array. We've covered iterating through the data. We've covered both uh, like for i and range. We've also covered the while loop. And we did the if, elif, and else. So you have a look at that. We know we've looked at the input. It's time to have a little fun. Let's do a short program. And we're going to play a game of hangman. So let's go ahead and create a hangman on here. And I have a preset list, like um, a good cook. Okay, I don't know about a good cook that has dynamite and stationery in their thing. Or anaconda, bring in the snake. But we have words apples, anaconda, jasmine, dynamite, and stationery. So those are going to be our five words. That, and you can put any words you want on here. Certainly on there. And we went ahead and imported random. Random is a random number generator. And there's a lot of, there's some functionality in there and different options. But we're going to use that to select our word. And so our selection, we'll call SEL, equals words. So it's going to look at this list of words. And random.rand integer will create an integer. It's real important that we do an integer because if I look for um, the index 1.5, it'll give me an error because there is no 1.5. There's just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And so we're going to do a random integer between 0 and 4. Now a little different than our range where we didn't include the last one, the random does. So 0 to 4. And then we'll go ahead and print introduction to the game. Let's play hangman. You have five chances. It's kind of a guaranteed win since we have five words. And then we're going to do length equals lin of cell. And this is just going to count it. So I'm randomly picking out a word up here. And if it picked up apples, it would say, hey, this word has one, two, three, four, five, six letters in it. And we can do this. We can actually do, let's do print selection comma links. Let's just run that. And you'll see that, uh, let's play hangman. You have five chances. And it did randomly pick out apples. And it says it has six letters. One, two, three, four, five, six, just like we counted on there. And then let's create a list equals an empty list. And then we'll do for i in range zero to length. Now remember, the length is six. It doesn't include the six, but we're including the zero. So we do zero to length. So this is going to be zero to five, which is six. It equals six on there. And we're just going to take our list and let's append, we'll append an underscore. So as we guess, we can start doing things with our guesses on here. So there we go. For i in range 0 to length, list append, and we have just a row of blank lines. And we said we're going to give you five chances, so chances equals five, filled equals zero. So you're starting off with a score of zero and five guesses. And it says while chances is greater than zero, so you still have chances left. Usually we've been doing a lot of equals. And just like you can, you can do this in if2. It's a logic statement. You can have chances greater than zero and filled not equal to length. So as we fill them, we're going to count this. We're going to count how many letters are in there and keep track of that. So once uh, zero hits the length, we're done. That means we got it. And we'll create a flag. Sometimes I use, well, we'll just call this flag equals zero. Let me go ahead and close this down just a little bit so you can see what we're doing a little better. And then we want to go ahead and get a character from as an input. So our character is an input make guess. A, B, C, you know, whatever's on there. For index, comma, I, N, numerate, cell. And this is really a cool line. Remember I talked about key value pairs? This is a list, so the index is the key. I could have easily put key in here. And with the dictionary, when we did the months, if I had done this, it would have returned the month and the value. So you'll see key value here sometimes. In this case, index, comma, I. And we're going to enumerate over the selection. That's the random word we picked out. And it says, if I equals character, we want to do something. So, hey, I guessed one. My I looks like the character. List of index equals character. So what I've done is I've said, hey, we found a character that's in our um, selection. The indexes are going to match. So this is one of those things where having the going through a pointer versus an actual value. We've used the index as our pointer and we're going to set that equal to the character. So it'll fill it out for us. And we say, oh, you got one. So we want to do filled. We're going to increment it by one. So remember, if I put the plus sign before the equal, we're adding one to filled. This is the same as filled equals filled plus one shorthand and we'll say flag equals one 
So once we've gone through all the indexes and we filled in each character that matches, because some of these have, like, Anaconda has three A's. So you would have filled in all three A's on there. And that's why we use the flag. And you could have easily done flag equals true, flag equals false. But we've gone through the index, and once we've looped through the index, we know that the flag is either 0 or 1. And if it's one, we got it. If not, if flag equals zero, then we did we don't got it. We didn't get the right answer. And so chances, you want to subtract your chances, because you only get five, we're gonna take it down by one. And then print you have put a placeholder there, chances remaining, and then of course we have our placeholder and chances. Keeps track of how many times they miss guess. There's a couple ways we can do the next setup on here in the while statement. We could do if filled print grats u1. And let's bring this back one because I don't want it part of the uh, loop up there. But we do need to know what was filled. Forgot a step there. We'll do for i in list. And let's print i plus space comma end equals dun dun there we go so what we're doing uh, here for i and list is we're going to print out all the letters so we print i print a space between each one so it's either going to be an underscore or the letter we guessed and we've added this is kind of an interesting statement on here end equals empty so that means instead of printing it on the next line it's going to print it on one line and then we want to go ahead and let's see make a guess I always like to, let's add a scoop in here for readability. And then skipping back down, so we've gone through, we've got our guess, we printed out what we've guessed so far. If uh, we get to the end of the while statement, where filled is not equal to length, so once it's equal to length, we're done, or chances are done. It then comes in here and says, if filled equals length, print congrats you one, else print, we'll be nice about it, we won't say anything mean, I don't like lose or anything like that, we'll just say better luck next time. And let's go ahead and run this. Open up our window down here and hit the run. And it says, let's play Hangman. You have five chances. Make a guess. So I'll type in A. And look at that. I got A. And let's see, make a guess. Let's see, what should be my guess now? It can't be Anaconda. Let's do P. I'm going to guess Apple. I got the Apple. And then let's go ahead and do, oh, let's make a wrong guess. S. Make a guess Apples. Oh, I forgot S was in there. So we'll do a D. D's not in there. You have four chances remaining. Oh no, uh, maybe there's E. Okay, so apples, how about Q? No Q, I got three chances left. And we'll just go ahead and do L. There we go, congratulations, you won. Yay, you've won. So you can see here we wrote a simple code uh, with our while loop that just loops through guesses and made a basic hangman. Uh, we've covered a lot of things today, which is exciting. I love covering lots of different information. So hopefully you've picked up on some basic Python, which is exciting. Definitely, if you have questions, leave leave notes down below in the YouTube video or come visit us at www.simplylearn.com. I want to thank you for joining us today. Again, we have a great team at the Simply Learn setup, which I'm a member of, which I'm very glad to be a member of. Look forward to hearing from you, and hopefully we'll see you in the future. Happy learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.